Well, buongiorno, compagnieri. Come stai? <laughs> well, I would give my whole talk in uh, Venetian, but I only speak a little bad Italian. But you can uh, sympathize. Because this is really the dessert on the cruise that we're on in one of the great places in Europe. And, uh, oh, there goes my, my, my lights again. Uh, and I know many of you have been to Venice many, many times, or if this is your first time, uh, they say you must fall in love with Venice, but you must leave her. Because if you, you, if you stay, then you'll never leave. And I remember I first came as a young backpacker when I was a, a bit of a younger lad, and I was camping in the wintertime in Venice because it was, there was nobody there and it wasn't quite so crowded uh, as it is even now in the winter with all the festivals. And so I remember I put up a tent on the, on the Arsenale, which is now the site of the, uh, the great art fairs. And Venice has become ever more visited. And of course, we are sailing in within the hour or so. It has become such a destination that now it has some 30 million visitors a year. And on any given day, there's often more visitors than there are residents in the historic center. And many of the people of Venice live across the causeway in uh, Magetta and other towns out on the mainland because it's just uh, too expensive and too crowded to have the, let's say, the original residential life there. I mean, there are some, but the population of Venice has dropped dramatically over the centuries. At the, at in the 1600s, there were about 200 or 1,000 more people right in the downtown. Now there are maybe 50,000 that have a home there. And the whole city has turned toward uh, the world to have more and more visitors. And I'll, I'll discuss it a little bit more, but I'm just going to give you an overview of what it is if you have been there or are there for the first time. This is actually the uh, island just off the, uh, the Grand Canal of uh, San Giorgio Magliore, which is its own island with its great church in it across from San Marco. And uh, so you have a very unusual geographic setting, which is why Venice became what it is on the Great Lagoon and with three different inlets into the Venetian Lagoon. The city was founded in the seventh century. There's no real founding documents of it, but it, it was said to have been the refuge of the, the upland people who came out into the lagoon on the little islands to get away from the Visigoths and the other barbarians that were raging across northern Italy that finally came down and sacked Rome. So Venice became sort of a fortress town that they could defend from the troubles ashore, but that left it on this island that was largely built by the residents over the many, many years. Uh, you can see the causeway that goes to the larger industrial and inland area. Uh, but back even in the, uh, over a thousand years ago, they diverted the rivers on the plains so that they would come in and continue to direct water toward the island of, uh, the main islands of Venice so they would never silt up. And then they could defend themselves by water because as the uh, battles ashore came, then the Venetians could safely retreat behind their walls and had uh, enough armament so that they were, they were never really conquered until Napoleon came in and took it in 1797. But just today, now you can see you have the causeway, the airport, and different things. Airport up on the top, the airport, uh, Marco Polo, they've named it. And then all the various parts of the city proper. But uh, as you can see, it does not have much room. And we will be sailing in right through that uh, Canal uh, Guideca, that's between the islands to the cruise terminal, which is on the top of this picture. And then we can take various uh, water taxis and things into the center of town. Now, again, we'll be on the left of this picture. And then we go visit Morano, is the island to the north. And the center of the heart of the city is right at the center of that uh, turn in the canal. There we go, a little bit closer. The uh, Basilica of Giovanni and Paolo and uh, other historic sites. Uh, they do note on the map the Co Collezione P uh, Peggy Guggenheim, and that was the American heiress who was the great patron of the arts who 
bought her own palazzo in Venice and then it is today a museum of contemporary art. I had another friend who was of a similar bent and uh, she was an art patron and collector and ran a gallery in New York but she inherited another palazzo in Venice and again has it as not as an exhibition space but as a um, artist studios where you can apply and you get a three-month residency there to live in Venice and to write or paint or make music whatever it is but everywhere there's a very tight town it's uh, remarkably uh, congested and built up on all of it and it's been expanded a bit over the time here's where the old uh, Venetian Navy Arsenale would construct the great galleys of the Navy of Venice at its height now that's been turned into exhibition space for the Biennale and other exhibitions and activities particularly in the in the winter months but in the summer months the city is swamped with visitors many of them come out to the great beaches this is the original Lido that name has been carried around the world along with the name of Venice but this is one of the beaches that are full on either side of the historic city all through the summertime and we'll be sailing right through this the uh, Guideca Canal that island was was named the, the the banished they would send people into prison there when they had wars and things and then it became built up again with uh, seaside villas and now is a incorporated into the larger city. Here's uh, San Giorgio Maggiore again. You can go out if you have the time on the Vaporetti, the water buses to all of these places and go walking around, but there's so much of Venice that is just right in the center that uh, again you could spend months there and still only feel like you've, you've haven't discovered it all because it's so many little nooks and crannies and canals and homes and things to see in the city. Facing the causeway there used to be this great gate the Zadar gate named after the Venetian town that's now in Croatia so they used to close the city walls and defend themselves that way now it is of course historic and the city's open um, but this is where we'll be passing right through near the Punta del Dogano the, the point of the of the doge or the Duke of Venice now that lower building again was used as a military arsenal in the old days but now again it's turned into an art museum so this is where the history of Venice has uh, been quite a roller coaster ride because it had was the great empire of the Mediterranean until the 1500s and then it has slowly but surely con converted itself into the perhaps the cultural capital of uh, of Europe in a sense that it is purely about culture these days and of course the great architecture but you could just see how crowded it is all those buildings that are sitting on wooden pilings some put down a thousand years ago and it's a very uh, unusual fact that they would create a watery floating city it's been called a candy fantasy built of stone floating in the water well the piles go down 20 meters or more into the below the sand into a hard clay and they took alder trees mostly from Croatia and the uh, Slovenia and they would drive them manually down till they stopped going down and then they would put limestone caps on them and then build the palazzo on it and so there's been subsistence by the centuries but most of them have held up pretty well remarkably even though they're always in need of some uh, repair and then you get around by the great famous gondolas, so which come in different sizes. This is the usual one, about six people can go aboard, and there's smaller ones called Saporno that only carry two people for the romantic evening uh, gondolas ride. Um, but there used to be about 10,000 of these water taxis back before they had motors and such. Now there are only about 400 left. And so if you haven't tried that before, it's one of the one of the great experiences of Venice now it is a bit of a let's say for the tourists now and uh, a couple aboard here have come all the way to just do that so the romance continues but as they say in Venetian you don't want to get too uh, romantic that you'll rock the boat um, but uh, they cost about 80 euros an hour and then they uh, if you want them to sing that means a, a bigger tip so uh, let's say it's an expensive uh, fantasy in a way but it, it, one of the things people do these are the Vaporetti which 
run all through the canals into all the out, outside islands. You can imagine back before engines where it was quite a row to get anywhere. And there's criticism about the cruise ships that come in as somehow damaging the foundations of the buildings. Well, the cruise ships actually go around and go into a terminal, and they don't create such a bad wake compared to the Vaporetti, which are speeding along and creating more of a chop and all through the historic center of them. But uh, if you don't have those, then you can't service the city. Well, this is the center, the Piazza San Marco, and this is where the city gets its name of the uh, the sanctuary for St. Mark the Evangelist, whose relics were smuggled out of Egypt in the ninth century in a barrel of pork fat, supposedly, and then brought to Venice and then put in the basilica, and that is the patron saint of Venice. The Campanile, the great bell tower, has been there originally for about 900 AD, uh, built up slowly, it's been repaired, etc. but it has a beautiful bell tower and that's where Galileo first tested his telescope, his optical instrument that he invented, and also dropped the balls that he um, tested gravity by. So this has a great deal of historical context. Next to the plaza on the right here is the Doge's Palazzo. And this was the, the Duke of Venice who was not royalty, it, the, the the city was really run by uh, uh, the nobility and the merchant families who would then have a grand council, who would then choose a senate, who would then elect a doge, who would be a lifelong ruler. And this palace is particularly unusual because it has a lot of uh, Moorish, Arabic style arches and uh, columnades. So it is a mixed architectural heritage that reflects the empire of Venice and its height. It was also a prison and has many um, uh, throne rooms, the uh, Scala d'Oro and other uh, interiors that are quite remarkable. And if it's not too crowded, you can get in and go see it. But uh, this is all along the Grand Canal, which is the main waterway through the center of the city. And I'm, I'm sure you're going to go off on tour, just go walking around or just get on a Vaporetti. It is uh, uh, they say you can see all the pictures you want of Venice, but when you're actually there, you have this emotional sense of being in a different place from our traffic jammed uh, realities usually. And so you have to walk, climb over the bridges, uh, walk on the narrow staircases, go up to the Rialto Bridge, which used to be a wooden bridge, but this is the fanciest and most famous of all the, the bridges of uh, central Venice. Uh, and now it has shops on it. Uh, back in the history, the, the, the neighborhoods of Venice had competing families, and once a year they would have mock battles to invade the other side. They called them battagliori. And uh, for centuries, they would, the young guys would get up with knives and swords and spears, and they would pretend like they were fighting, but it would get out of hand, and they'd throw each other in the river, and people would drown. So finally, the doge banned the battles on the bridge. Now the battles are mostly uh, trying to get into the shops to get the, the leather goods and the lace and the various products of Venice. So it's become a different kind of struggle just at the height of summer like we're going to be here now. It's very crowded, but uh, just a taste of it is enough. This is the bridge of size of the Ponte di Sispiro, which is where they said the prisoners, often prisoners of war, were brought in to be sold as slaves often, and this was next to the prison where they would be sent. So Lord Byron came here in the mid-1800s uh, and he, he wrote this, I stood in Venice on the bridge of sighs, a palace and a prison on each hand, and I saw from out the wave her structures rise as from the stroke of the enchanter's wand. A thousand years their cloudy wings expand Around me and a dying glory smiles o'er the far times when many a subject land looked to the winged lion's marble piles where Venice sat in state, throned on her hundred isles. Well, this was 
just the way of the world back then. Venice made its original commerce by being the trading point in the medieval period of the slave trade where they would have raiding parties go into the, the east, the Romania, Hungary, Croatia, all these countries that far, and they would capture people and then bring them to Venice, put them on the galleys and go sell them to the Arabs and the Middle East. So this was the beginning of the slave trade, and that's why we call it slave after the Slavs who were preyed upon. And of course that terrible history has gone on in other forms around the world to this day. But the, just the architecture is so fantastic. These marble and uh, terracotta elaborate buildings, um, which were an example of how wealthy Venice became from its domination of the Mediterranean trade as time went by. And so you, you may have seen uh, particularly the uh, one of those Bond movies, maybe it's Casino Royale, where they have a big fight in one of these palazzo, and, and in the midst of the action, the entire building collapses into the, into the waterway. Now, at the bottom of the film, they said no, no palazzos were injured making this film. So it was all a digital fantasy, but uh, it's just remarkable that they, again, standing on wooden piles that uh, do not get eaten by uh, any borers, it's because it's an alder wood that is sort of a water or insect and decay proof wood, but it's, it's quite a tremendous uh, construction considering that it's all just almost floating. This is the uh, Donaldo and Daniele Hotel, one of the finer ones in the town. Uh, there are accommodations, and many of them, or some of them, are still private homes. Palazzo Cavilli, Franchetti. It was the thing for European royalty in previous centuries to have their own palazzo in Venice, and many a young princeling would go to Venice to have some education, let's say, and learn the finer arts of debauchery. In the 1600s, they said there were over 12,000 registered prostitutes in. In, in Venice there just to help the young fellows along in their education. Hear more of them, the Carazniko. So there are many, there are hundreds of them. And uh, many of them are closed up because they're in f structural conditions that are not modernized. Others have been fixed up. But the, the whole city is a World Heritage UNESCO site, so you cannot renovate the exterior. You can improve the interior. Uh, and the other thing about Venice is that it has this uh, fantasy life, not just the architecture or the waterways, but the people are very animated, and this comes out most of all in Carnaval in, in, uh, just before Easter. And so the Venetian theater and street life, the Commedia dell'arte and the other uh, improvised uh, theater is very uh, uh, fantastic, especially the masks. You'll see a lot of these masks for sale. But everybody gets dressed up at a certain time of year, and you too can. Do. Maybe tonight we'll have a masquerade on, on board, but uh, I think we'll be packing. Uh, here's the great uh, La Fenice, the Phoenix Theater, which was one of the great opera houses of Italy. It's where Rossini and uh, Puccini premiered many of their, their works, along with La Scala and Milano and others around Italy. But this is particularly elegant theater that has uh, a great deal of history behind it, and it's open for tours in the day, but they have shows in the evening, and if you want to afford a uh, better, t uh, more, uh, less outrageous ticket price, you can be in the, uh, the gallery standing through the show. Uh, here's one of the main writers for the Venetian theater, Carlo Gold, who was, uh, his statue's out there, but he wrote a lot of the comedy and uh, satire in Venetian, so other Italians often can't understand the dialect. They have to get a, uh, let's say, notes to find out what they're talking about because the Venetians are so particular in many things they do. They are a little bit different than all the other Italians who, are, of course, are all very different from each other in certain ways. But uh, the other great arts of Venice are glass blowing, also lace and paper making and jewelry, so there's plenty of uh, things to see and to, to buy. The, some things are a little more delicate than others. I wouldn't put that in your handbag. But if you're really looking for something in your uh, dining room, how about that? So this is where Venice took what was originally a Persian art, came from ancient Persia 
came to Venice on the trade routes and then the Venetian artisans mastered their own way of doing it. And so some of us are going out to Murano, which is uh, an island off of uh, the main area. Uh, this sort of a, dr a dreamy portrait of the outer islands back uh, a couple of centuries ago, but they're still there, and that's where the glassworks were moved because they need foundries and supplies to uh, work on. So they put the workshops on this island just north of the main city, and uh, that has a bit of a flair, a flavor of what Venice was like when it was a very small place back now a thousand or more years ago, with again the canals, and you can a uh, bell tower over the church, which is their own version of the leaning tower, uh, but particularly the, the uh, tradition on the, this outer island, uh, also the other one, Barano, is that the people will paint their houses in different colors so that they can identify, uh, we live in that, that red house. Uh, as, as the city developed, uh, they did not number the houses, they just knew who everybody was but they could distinguish themselves by painting these houses very bright colors, which remains to this day. So it's a little more cheerful and, let's say, uh, not so pretentious as the Grand Palazzos in the center of the city. And they get to display their, 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 uh, their laundry, which is something that the, 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 the doge would not allow in town. So this is just one of 118 islands that are in the lagoon, some of which are natural preserves now and bird sanctuaries, but there are many of them that are populated like this with their own canals cut through and their own construction. So this again is Murano. And it's a quiet place. There's not that many people who go out there. So at the time when the the, pl the plazas in the center city are just packed with people. You can take the nice day out there and then come back in the evening when it's not so cr crowded with people. Well, this is the symbol of Venice uh, with the winged lion of St. Mark's. And so this is where, let's say, the, 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 the depth of Christianity was a very powerful force and Venice was called the bulwark versus the Ottoman Turks who were invading. And so for the 12th to the 14th century, they were constantly fighting the Turks and keeping the forces of uh, Islam out of the rest of Europe. And I mentioned how down at Corfu, which was a Venetian fortress, was considered the key island to keep the Ottoman fleets from coming in and attacking Venice or else uh, sacking Rome as they planned to do and it was the Battle of Lepanto that finally stopped that warfare at, at its breach off the coast of uh, Rhodes in, in the Aegean. But here for instance is a Greek uh, antiquity of the lion that was brought from a temple in Greece. Many of the treasures of Venice are actually brought from their military campaigns from the Crusades on all the way from Constantinople in the Middle East. And the, 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 the founding myth of Venice is that the sea provided all this wealth. So this is a, a depiction of Neptune bringing the wealth of the world to the Lady of Venice, which was literally true. They brought in gold, uh, jewels and all kinds of treasures that are seen in, in the treasuries and the museums all through Venice. And this has uh, led Venice to be perhaps the most opulent and elegant and wealthiest city up until the Renaissance when others flourished like Florence and other, other cities in Europe. But this is an early depiction of the, uh, the Plaza San Marco with the doge and the religious activities blessing the enterprise of Venice. The empire extended down the Dalmatian coast, just where we were, down to Kurkula and uh, Istia and all these provinces. They did not have an empire inland. They were mainly concerned to preserve their maritime trade routes. So the Venetian navy would go all to these you know, remote places down the coast where we just came to prevent piracy and to establish fortresses and, and supply uh, support for their great fleets. At one point, Venice had over 3,000 galleys with over 35,000 sailors. And that was, if you've seen the, the, the sea out here, there's 